Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Abbas, and with me here is Team 23521 DeSoto Technics from Olive Branch, Mississippi. They were absolutely fantastic this season. They ended fourth at MTI, deep playoffs run, did great at the World Championship, just all around one of the best specimen robots in Into the Deep, and I can't wait to jump into their intake, outtake, all the parallelism they have going on, and more coming up on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and front runners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. DeSoto Technics, I guess my first question for you guys is you are very clearly a specimen specialized robot. Uh, at what point in the season did you make that decision to focus so much on that specimen game strategy and why? So we started the season wanting to be able to score both samples and specimens. So we better match with any potential alliance partners. After our state championship, we decided to further specialize, specialize for specimens as we saw a lot more sample teams. And so we thought we'd have more likely chance of being picked as a specimen robot and our robot better fit scoring specimens. So we decided to optimize for those. Awesome. Yeah. Now jumping right into the intake, uh, it's very, very fast. Just, just like the rest of your robot. Let's start with a high level overview of the slides, the arms, the claws, things like that. And then we'll jump into the specifics. So our intake is ran by 1150 one, uh, geared one-to-one. -one, so it allows us to have that fast extension. Uh, the intake is mounted on a coaxial virtual four bar. So we have one servo rotating the arm and one servo rotating the elbow. This allows us to have two independent degrees of, uh, degrees of freedom, which allows us to be very nimble and dispersible to pick up and also to transfer and for our sample pass. Yeah, awesome. So a couple questions there. Jumping into the claw, I see obviously the claw geometry to grab the uh, outside of the of the samples, but also these like rubber pads or something on the on the outside of the claw. Is that what are those for? How do you use them? Yeah, so those are baseball grip tape. So they're just for inside grip since it's just friction on the inside of the sample. So yeah. Okay, and so are you always grabbing the specimens with the by the or the samples by the inside, or also you can do from the outside in different situations? Yeah, so it's actually mainly outside grip. For MTI, we saw that like outside grip is a lot faster, and the worlds were always trying to use outside grip as much as we can. So. We mainly used outside grip. We also have inside grip if it's like up against a barrier, but we've gotten outside grip to like be able to pick up samples even when they're squished together. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and one thing uh, you know I think teams can learn a lot from is with these fast pickups. You know, a lot of teams have been adding like roll uh, servos or you know just like turrets so they can have that degree of freedom. But it's very difficult sometimes to use quickly. How have you guys made sure that you can use it super quickly and super effectively in your cycles? So we came up with the Crystal Virtual 4 bar system. Like that was one of our first designs we thought we wanted to use. And it's worked very well for us throughout the season just because with the, the two axons, it's very, very fast, very simple, and it has a lot less moving parts than like turrets or any other alternatives. Yeah. One thing I, I guess more like from the from the roll so that you can grab specimens or samples that are at like 90 degrees or zero degrees. Like uh, from a driver perspective, how do you switch quickly between those and you know what tips do you have for up? The control screen is incredibly simple. It's using the um, the um, um, left and right position of the joystick, and then it just goes straight down. Um, which the control scheme is quite simple. I some teams have like you know when they have a turret, they have to you know have camera vision, etc., which further complicates it. Um, but our control scheme is just very simple. It just uses um, the Y position of the joystick. And, yeah. So okay. with a lot of practice. Allows for very fast alignment for yeah. samples. Awesome. Now, jumping into that transfer mechanism, you guys have a couple different ways of getting that sample out of your robot. Let's start with just transferring um, out. I think you have both out the back and out the side. Is that correct? Or if you can, guys can explain yeah. it, that'd be awesome. So we can transfer using inside grip and outside grip to our outtake to then score in the baskets. And we can also drop off this ramp here for small specimens. So we can So that is transferring from outside grip. Transfer from inside grip. Like that, and drop off. 
Yeah, awesome. So starting off with that whole outside versus inside grip, are, are those uh, transfer sequences automated? Like it just depends how you pick up this sample and then that'll change what the transfer sequence is like, or is that also manual input based? It is automated based on the position, whether it's inside or outside grip. Mm -hmm. um, the cool. positions are pretty similar, but like there's just they're slightly tweaked by um, yeah. a couple degrees. Yeah, and as far as that side depositing goes, is that something you guys have had from the beginning of the season, or was it like a later addition? If so, what made you like realize that this is something that's really going to change the game? That is something we added after Worlds. As we saw, a lot of teams that had some like that had specimen robots, they had that sample pass through, usually with a turret or some kind of ramp. And so we saw we needed a uh, we needed a faster way, as we used to have our intake transfer to our outtake and then drop it off. But since the sample is really high, it could bounce outside the observation zone. So this is where we found the need for this ramp here. So we actually, the we were thinking between a turret and this ramp. But we decided to go on this ramp as it's completely passive and is independent of the intake. So we didn't have to make any changes to the intake. It was just plug and play, just make it to another position. And it drops that sample off completely independent of the outtake. So we can then pick up a specimen right as we drop it off the yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Now, as far as game strategy is concerned a little bit, with this whole multi-transfer system, how do you guys decide when you're going to go out the side, when you're going to go out the back? What are some of the huge factors, and you know how can rookie teams learn from that? So our strategy is we count the samples on the submersible that are accessible from the chamber side. We will then subtract that from our nominal amount of specimens we want to score in a match. With that uh, amount that we found, we will get those from the rung side. So say there's 10 accessible from chamber, we want 15, we subtract that, we get five. So we get five from rung. And then on the fifth one, we will use the ramp to pick up right as we drop off. We will then start parallelizing from the chamber. So we will then score a specimen, pick up a sample, drop it off, pick up a specimen, and then keep score, pick up, score, pick up. Very cool, very cool. Now talking about that uh, specimen pickup off the wall, it seems like you guys are just incredibly consistent with that. I think there's two or three big factors there. What do you think contributes most to that consistency in those specimen pickups? Yeah, so we can you go. So one of the main factors that makes our pickup really consistent is we use the is we use this specimen aligner. So um, it just funnels the specimens down. It just funnels the specimens down right here. So before at Worlds, we didn't have this and sometimes um, specimens would just get wobbled and stuff like that. But this time it just holds them right there. And then this thing, can just, and then the outtake lock can just pick up from above and it's very consistent. Yeah, and talking about the specimen aligner, uh, what was the purpose of adding that springing into the system? Oh yeah, so um, the reason why it's sprung is because we pick up specimens with, with the outtake like higher up whereas its idle position is down and we can't put um the specimen liner on the outtake because the claw goes right there so when it's idle position it just pushes it down but when it's um in the pickup position the specimen liner just goes up so then it, for, um, for picking up the specimen awesome yeah and i think i saw one match you guys had a sample get stuck in your robot but then you were able to retract that uh, specimen aligner down and knock it out is that an activated retraction or is it just passively sprung so that is one thing we did to mitigate the risk of this of this design as once we added the ramp and the specimen aligner samples could get stuck in between the outtake slides so this is just a manually operated servo right here so it's an axon mini and this just allows us to pull that down very cool. So you can see there we can activate it and so that just allows the driver to pull it down so even if the sample gets stuck we can get it out. Very cool, very cool. And um, also I see the touch sensor right there on that specimen aligner right next to it. Walk me through how you use that. That's um, in use during auto. Um, one thing you might have noticed is during autonomous we um, really hit the wall um, going almost full power. So it, that just means that as soon as we get that, we instantly grab and then we'll reverse and go back to the chamber. We also have similar touch sensors on the front for um, detecting the um, chamber um, bar. Awesome. Yeah. And as far as uh, like consistency with that goes, was there was there any issues with having a touch sensor only on one side um, for for that specimen pickup? I noticed you have them on both sides for that intake in the front. That was mainly just for redundancy because, as you can see, we have these TPU bumpers and they're really quite beat up because it, 
really slams into it, so we're just worried about one of them breaking, and that way, if one of them breaks, we still have a backup. Okay, so as far as a code perspective goes, you're only reading if one or the other, uh, you know, yeah. lights up. It's not that both of them have to uh, be triggered in order to continue your path. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Yeah, and talking a little bit about the software, when you do have these pathings, you mentioned that you rely entirely on those sensors to know when to move on. Uh, from like a pathing perspective, is it kind of you have your path generated to a point near the submersible wall, and then you break from that and keep going forward, or how does that work from your code side? We have the set points that are like um, a couple inches past um, where the field would normally be, and then once we see that, okay, the touch sensor's been activated, then we break from that and do whatever um, happens after we hit that barrier. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Now, uh, talking a little bit also about just like the side plates and things like that, it seems like very heavily pocketed aluminum. Any oh. concerns as far as strength or rigidity or anything like that goes, or would you, could, uh, would you encourage teams to like really pursue these super heavily pocketed designs? So we started with using, this is our take on Ferrani's style pocketing. We did this mainly just for weight reduction and we would just fact check it with some of our mentors to make sure that it was strong enough. And then since we, we liked the look of this pocketing, that's why we also 3D printed, or we pocketed all our 3D printed plates. So it's mainly just for weight reduction and it's really up to the team's need if they need to reduce the weight at a time of how much pocketing they want to do. We did increase the pocket sizes from our V1 to V2 robot to reduce more weight. And this also allows us to access the inside of the robot more easily in places that are hard to get to. Sure, and as far as weight goes then, how heavy is this robot? It is around 13 kilograms, 29-ish, 28, 27. Yeah, well, DeSoto Te Technics, thank you guys so much. You've been just absolutely fantastic every single season. You know, MTI last year, MTI this year, super strong performances each time. Can't wait to see what you guys bring for our uh, upcoming game in just a few months. Reporting for FUD Robotics Network, I'm Abbas, and this is Team 23521, DeSoto Technics. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and frontrunners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu first.